Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is Barbara Miller from Museum of the Moving Image. Uh, these past few weeks, we've been bringing you programs that we're calling Momi at Home. Tonight is an event in our Jim Henson's World conversation series. Last week, you might have been here with us um, with a, a fantastic conversation we had with Frank Oz and Dave Goles. And tonight, we're taking a different angle um, on the world of Jim, Jim Henson and focusing on museums, museum collections with material related to Henson's amazing career, including our own. We look forward to welcoming you to Momi in person when we reopen so you can see things like the Jim Henson exhibition that we have, um, along with lots of other things in our galleries and our theaters. In the meantime, we'll continue bringing you events like this one, along with a lot of other great content. Just check our website, movingimage.us for a calendar. And as you know, this event is free, but we sincerely hope that you'll make a donation to the museum in whatever amount you are able to and support other great institutions like this one so we can continue bringing you events like this. Um, and um, in addition, that we have the support that we need to open our doors when we get to the other side of this lockdown. Just a couple of things, please feel free to use the Q&A feature that you see on your screens to pose questions. Um, we have Susie Tofty, Collections Manager at the Jim Henson Company, working behind the scenes and she'll be answering some questions directly. And we'll get to answer some of your questions on air towards the end of the conversation. Um, the moderator of tonight's conversation is Karen Falk, Archives Director at the Jim Henson Company and Vice President of the Jim Henson Legacy. Karen has been um, both a catalyst for so many of us who carry the torch for Henson's legacy and also an indispensable resource as we interpret and preserve that history. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Karen to join us on screen and she will introduce our other guests for tonight. Welcome, Karen. Hi, Barbara. Thanks Hi. for hosting us tonight. <laughs> It's, um, it's great to be here. Um, Momi is uh, my home away from home professionally. It's down the street from our office. And um, so I get to work with Barbara almost on a weekly basis, which is terrific. But um, tonight is uh, an extra special night for me because we're also gonna be talking to two other curators who are caretakers of Henson collections, significant collections that were donated to these institutions by the Henson family. Um, over the last um, eight to 10 years. And um, so they are working hard to help us preserve and present Jim Henson's body of work. This is something uh, that was near and dear to Jane Henson's um, heart. Jim always liked museums. He loved sharing behind the scenes at, um, uh, in the studio and his work. He did documentaries, he had books, but he also loved exhibits. And uh, so he was, he was very excited when his characters were in museums. And um, after he passed and Jane Henson established the Jim Henson legacy, bringing together a group of Jim's friends and, and colleagues to help her um, continue to preserve and present Jim's work. Um, the, the group, um, which included me, um, has worked over the years to uh, try to place the collections uh, into museums around, around the country. And um, so without further ado, let me introduce um, those people that are here with Barbara and me. Um, first, Brian, Ryan Lintelman, if you wanna take off your camera. Um, Ryan is the um, curator of, of the entertainment collection at the National Museum of American History at the Smithsonian Institution. And um, he's been working for many years with this collection. Um, and we're excited that he has a lot of great plans for the Henson materials in his collection. And then um, our other colleague is Jill, Jill Nash Malul. Um, and Jill is the director of the Worlds of Puppetry Museum, which is at the Center for Puppetry Arts in Atlanta. And um, has recently, I guess your most recent exhibit that you put up is the, um, Jim Henson's Dark Crystal, The World of Myth and Magic. And um, of course, she oversees their permanent Jim Henson gallery in their museum. Um, so I thought we'd just start off talking with the three of you um, about your uh, relationship to the Hensons, the Henson family, how the collections came to you, um, and you know what they mean to the institution. So why, why don't we start with you, Ryan, because I think the Smithsonian is the first place that had Muppets in there. On display. 
Yeah, and uh, thanks to all my fellow panelists and everyone, welcome. Uh, we're really uh, glad for the opportunity to talk with you today and share our love for the Muppets and our collections. Um, at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History, we are really honored to have 34 original Muppets and more than 120 Henson-related objects in our collections across the museum. Um, and as Karen uh, kind of hinted at, actually we've figured out in the course of our discussions here that we're probably the first museum to have ever exhibited Muppets, uh, it, dating back to 1975 in our We the People exhibition that opened uh, for the Bicentennial at what was then the National Museum of History and Technology. Uh, we had this exhibition that looked at the, uh, the whole variety of, of ways of looking at American life, which is what the museum still does today, uh, kind of exploring the American experience through material culture and collections. Uh, so we had a section of that exhibit that was dedicated to education. And at that time in 1975, with Sesame Street just a few years old, that was a, a really big topic about what was happening mm -hmm. new in education, thinking about technology and new media uh, at that moment. And so um, we were able to get Bird and Ernie on display um, mm -hmm. back then in 1975. And they were on display for uh, five years for the uh, term of that exhibition and then extended another 10 years after that. So that's, um, as far as we know, mm -hmm. the earliest that, that Muppets were on display. Um, and ever since they've had a presence at the museum. So uh, over the course of, of the past uh, decades, you know, we've, we've collected more and we're really thankful to the Henson family for continuing gifts in 2010 when we got the Salmon Friends, the original mm -hmm. Muppets uh, in our collection. And then in 2013, when we got a big batch of Muppets that was really great that helped us to tell the story of Henson's creativity and imagination um, from Salmon Friends all the way through to the Dark Crystal and Fraggle Rock uh, and beyond. So um, we've got a really great collection and we use it uh, in exhibitions and programming all the time. Um, and I've kind of made it my own mission and being the curator uh, in the entertainment collection at the museum to keep Muppets on the floor at all times. So, uh, you know, help me meet that goal. <laughs> Hold my feet to the fire. <laughs> Well, you know, Jim was from Washington, so I think being in the Smithsonian was was really special, was was meaningful to him during his lifetime. And of course, um, when Jane Henson came down during the donation ceremony for the Salmon Friends puppets, um, she was tickled. Um, she had uh, Willard Scott, um, who had been on early Washington television with her, was there for the ceremony. And um, it was really a wonderful occasion for, for all of us and for for you and the Henson family um, to, to see those there. Now, um, there's also a very long relationship with the Center for Puppetry Arts in Atlanta. So Jill, if you could just tell us a little bit about um, how your collection came to you. Um, so the Center for Puppetry Arts is located in Atlanta, Georgia, and we are so lucky to have had this 40 plus year relationship with the Henson family. On the day that we opened in 1978, uh, Kermit, cut the ceremonial ribbon, mm -hmm. uh, Jim and Jane were there and um, had been supportive of Vince Anthony, who is our founding executive director, who just recently retired um, of his creating the center. And our mission is to educate and inspire through the art of puppetry. So we do that in th uh, three main ways. We have um, live performances of puppetry um, normally, <laughs> almost every day of the year. Mm -hmm. And then we have this wonderful education program where we're creating puppets and allowing people to learn how to be puppeteers and to manipulate puppets. And then we have the part that I run, which is our Worlds of Puppetry Museum, where we um, show puppets as a static art form, but um, show the breadth of global puppetry around the world. And, um, you know, Jim Henson didn't start out to be a puppeteer, but he, uh, embrace that as um, one of the many talents that he has and uh, obviously very talented <laughs> and um, became part of the puppetry community and would go to festivals and met, that's how he met Vince and um, when Vince said he wanted to open a place that did this Jim said yes you should do that and and Kermit and I will be there so that's um, how we got started with them and then um, once the family decided they wanted to start uh, putting objects in museums. We were very, very fortunate to be able to um, accept donations and uh, we have uh, about 500 costumes, pop, props, and puppets. And um, we have 4,000 square feet devoted to Jim Henson and his legacy as a puppeteer and as a genius and imagine and his wonderful imagination. And then we have a special exhibits gallery that's about a thousand square feet that we have all kinds of different uh, topics on, but right now is devoted to uh, talking about the uh, genius of the dark crystal. Right, and you had a labyrinth exhibit there before, and then you also showcase your world puppetry 
uh, collection as well in right. that gallery. Um, and so Barbara, yes. um, our neighbor down the street in Queens, um, tell us about uh, the Museum of the Moving Image and, and your relationship with the Hemsworth Well, um, you, are, you are a big part of that story, Karen. Um, we, um, it's, it's sort of a long story. I'll try and make it fairly concise, but um, the museum had a major expansion. We opened a larger building in 2011 and we had a, a large changing exhibition space. And the um, exhibition that Karen was curator of that toured through the Smithsonian's traveling um, exhibition uh, service, service. <laughs> Smithsonian Institution Traveling Exhibition Service um, that was touring around the country, um, it had not had a New York venue. And we had just opened with this larger gallery where we could finally accommodate it because when that exhibition started touring around the country, we didn't have space for it. But then in the end, we did. Um, and Karen, Karen, Karen took it at, as her mission to make sure that there was a New York venue for Jim Henson's Fantastic World. Um, and we opened that exhibition at Momi. And that was really the beginning of our relationship with the Henson Company, with the Jim Henson Legacy, and with the family. And when we had that exhibition at Momi, it was very, very successful for us. It really opened up um, a big community of um, of visitors, of, of, of people that really wanted to stay connected to that story or, um, of, of, around the characters. But really um, what resonated for us was, was that Jim was such an innovator in the, in, in the moving image, in the world of film, in the world of television, in moving image technology. So there, there, you know, we, it, it was a story that we felt very, um, really spoke to a lot of things in our mission. So it was a successful exhibition for us. And when that exhibition closed, and the Henson Legacy, which had, and Karen can talk a, a little bit more about this, the Jim Henson Legacy had um, managed this historic collection of artifacts for many, many years um, and was looking at the, at the conclusion of Jim Henson's Fantastic World to, um, to get out of the collections business and to find museums that would carry that legacy on. Um, so it was uh, obviously the CPA was involved, the Smithsonian had their collection and we were approached as being a home uh, for some of that, that material, uh, but it required us finding a space where we could create an ongoing exhibition for uh, you know, the, to tell, tell Jim's uh, story and the, the story of his collaborators and his impact in, on the world of film and television. And we had, the dust had literally not even settled from our big expansion. And we had to figure out a way to expand again. And um, I credit our executive director, Paul Goodman, Goodman, for having the vision to say, well, it's crazy <laughs> to do that, but we're gonna do it. And it has yeah. um, been really successful for us. We've had- And he ended up with a smaller office, I think. Yes, of... yes, we, we all have smaller offices and work in, in basements and, and other nicks and crannies so we can have visitors in our, gym, in our ongoing Jim Henson exhibition. And uh, we have a traveling version of that show also that is touring around the country now. And we worked um, very, I'll say, just to, to get it out there, and I know we'll come back to this a lot in the conversation, we worked very closely with Bonnie Erickson right. to, um, to review all of that material and to go over conservation approaches and all that. So Bonnie was really instrumental as a member of the Jim Henson's legacy in making that happen. And of course, the support of the family um, was, was indispensable. And, and also the support of the Jim Henson Company was really helpful along with Disney and Sesame yeah, Workshop and, and all of the partners that, um, that really have a stake in making sure that that legacy lives on in, um, in the best way possible. You know, I had a, a question um, from somebody wrote in um, asking, um, you know, if Jim had, had saved puppets specifically for museums or had museum preservation in mind. And because he was somebody that he wasn't precious about his puppets, if they needed to cannibalize a puppet to make a different puppet or something like that, um, they went ahead and did it. And, um, you know, he didn't uh, specifically make things you know, uh, with the museum in mind, although there were puppets that were made for exhibits on occasion. And I think all of you have some of the exhibit puppets in your collections, um, but they were made by the same people who made the performance puppets, made of the same materials, the same pattern, exactly the same way, um, but made 
uh, because during Jim's lifetime, there was a traveling exhibit, a series of traveling exhibits. Um, the other thing is with the preservation issues um, with the Skeksis, for example, Jim was eager after the Dark Crystal to exhibit the puppets and all of the craftsmanship that was uh, behind that film. Mm -hmm. um, but they were made with foam latex, which um, you all will talk a little bit about later. But um, but the they re cast the heads of the Skeksis in uh, fiberglass and then put new skins and everything on them so that they would be more stable for those exhibitions that Jim organized. And um, those are the heads that went into the permanent Jim Henson collection. So um, there was some thought um, on Jim's part uh, to be able to preserve these things in museums, but obviously uh, the production use and uh, the performance of the puppets was the priority. And um, we've all learned a lot about conservation um, in order to make the museum museum ready. Sure. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what, what you have in your collections. Um, and um, why don't we start with, uh, um, I don't remember the order of these. I think with Ryan. Ryan, Ryan was going to Ryan was first. So why don't yep. we start and look at some of the things in your collection, Ryan. Yeah, and, and I just wanted to uh, say on that, the topic you were just talking about, that one of the real pleasures of working with this collection is untangling all the histories yeah. of, of these puppets because you get the impression that, you know, the creature shop and all, all of these people who are working together were really just, you know, going 100 miles an hour at all times and, and things would get picked up again mm -hmm. and reused and modified and, um, you know, so it's not always clear the history of what puppet was used when and, and where it ended up. Um, yes, we, we all wish they had kept better records. <laughs> <laughs> But but Karen did a pretty and, good job. <laughs> <laughs> Karen and her team have done such a great job of caring yeah. for the archives, and um, it's it's really fascinating to me. I mean, you know, I, I love this kind of historical work, but you know, going to her and she'll open up a notebook and there's little samples of all of the types of felt <laughs> that uh, Kermit was ever made of, you know, and so you can kind of date. Kermit's based on you know the changing colors and materials over time and things like that or these uh, these tags so we'll get to that but you know you can you can find these numbers that you can trace in, in some mm -hmm. notebook to you know when that was made or when it was used um, so uh, you know working through all this um, that the photo that's that's up on our screens right now I think is um, from our uh, We the People exhibition in 1975 at the museum so this is what I mentioned was uh, as far as we can tell the first time that Muppets were ever exhibited in a museum setting um, and it, oh, wow. the museum was blown away by how popular Bert and Ernie were in this exhibition. Um, and so that kind of started this idea that, okay, we, we have to find ways to keep Muppets on the floor, mm -hmm. to add them to the national collections at the Smithsonian, um, because they function the same way that they did on Sesame Street as um, cute, funny, uh, you know, really big personalities that help to get to important topics. So for, you know, for instance, education, this is something that, uh, you know, at, at this moment, people were really interested in the way that Sesame Street was using television to educate. Um, and, you know, so it was something that was new, but of great historic interest already, the significance was known. Uh, so, you know, like I said, Bert and Ernie have been hanging around the museum a long time. Um, after that, you know, we um, continue to have an interest in not only the way that uh, these things, you know, demonstrated important topics in, throughout history, but also the unique story of Jim Henson and Jane Henson and, the, and um, all of the properties that have come out of that creative mind. So Sam and Friends, uh, of course, I'm sure that this audience is more familiar than most people with it, but uh, this being Jim's first show and, and, you know, he really wanted to work in television um, and, you know, happened to work with puppets that kind of, you know, came in through the back door rather than being somebody who was a puppeteer to begin with. Um, people love hearing the story and seeing how some of these characters uh, are so familiar, you know, this is the first Kermit here, for those who, who don't know, this mm -hmm. is um, from 1955. Um, and, you know, you can see Jim's jeans sticking out of the back there, you know. Right. Um, and so you get this real story of the creative mind, you know, using materials uh, in new ways. And, and, you know, the other thing that I love to tell people about this is that these are the first puppets ever created for television. You know, they weren't adapted from some other medium. These were, um, with the with full understanding of television and its uh, ability to reach people that, that Jim had because he really wanted to work in that medium. So, um, you know, some of the inherent vices that, that these have for a museum collection that they, the materials they're made out of are, uh, you know, 
foams that seem flexible at first but get brittle over time. The reason why they were so important and so popular to begin with was because the, the flexibility that that allowed was the opposite of wooden howdy doody or you know the, right. the biliquous dummies that you know had had defined puppetry up to that point, he was using new materials in a new way for a new medium. So um, these objects really help us to tell something about television history beyond just the story of, of Sam and Friends. Um, and then, uh, so this is a, a photograph from the 2013 donation to the museum from the Henson family. It gives you an idea of the range of the puppets that we have. So uh, this is Bert and Ernie here. Again, you know, Karen and I have been back and forth a lot about exactly when these are from, but we think these are some of the originals, if not the original puppets for Sesame Street that were created. We have the original rubber ducky too. That's not him there, but um, that's, that's one that was for exhibition use. So that's, that's a cool thing that we love to show people. And then you can see, you know, an Elmo from the 80s there. So each of these has their own story. Um, in the center there is a really great puppet for those of you who are big Henson fans. That's Wilkins from the Wilkins Brother Coffee Companies that um, was Jim's first wide exposure outside of the DC area and that he started to do advertising and build the company up from that. And uh, the Wilkins and Wilkins commercials, which are available online, are something that never fails to get a laugh from people. <laughs> so crazy out there. They put uh, the Simpsons itchy and scratchy to shame for <laughs> violence and uh, non sequiturs and really amazing, outstanding humor. So, um, you know, we can tell advertising stories with our collections. We can talk about children's television, as you see with the, the Fraggles there and Sesame Street. Um, and so this is one of the things that, that I did recently. One of the first exhibitions I curated in, in my job is uh, curator of the entertainment collection at the museum was looking at the history of children's television. So this uh, exhibit actually spanned uh, two different walls of a hallway of the museum, looking at the evolution of children's television and, and the idea that it could be used for more than just you know, putting kids in front of the TV and keeping them entertained for a while, but really to educate. So some of the prime examples of that are in our collection, the, the Muppets from Sesame Street, and you see Oscar and Prairie Dawn there, um, Mr. Rogers, and to the left there is uh, Bill Nye, who is also uh, another donor, recent donor to the museum because we have uh, really this fantastic children's television collection. So, um, you know, you can see the variety of ways that, that we use the Muppets. Um, in the future, we're, we're always looking for new ideas. Obviously we've been dealt uh, kind of a blow right now and that the museum is closed, but I was hoping to be able to tell you all about, and if you wanna to go to the next photo, I can talk yeah. about this. Um, one of the ideas that we've had in recent years is, uh, a, a sort of mobile exhibit where Muppets would be appearing all over the American History Museum uh, called Muppets Take American History. And uh, so, you know, the idea is that as you're walking through our transportation history exhibit, America on the Move, you might see Fozzie nearby a Studebaker uh, in that show and, you know, learn a little bit more about the history of the Muppets, but also how they connect to broader topics in American history. Or learn about bears and Studebakers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> as one does. <laughs> So I'm hoping that we'll be able to share more details about that as, as the picture becomes clear about when the museum is reopening and, and this thing's under control. But um, we're always trying to, to find new ways to, to use this collection, this incredible resource that we have. And um, obviously we know that visitors love it. So, um, right. yeah. So Jill, um, how about you? What do you got in your collection? So um, when you come to our museum, uh, you have a, the opportunity to either go into the Jim Henson Collection Gallery or the Global Collection Gallery. And um, these two galleries really complement each other. Uh, the Global Collection Gallery is set up so that it's organized by continent and um, you get to learn about all the different rich puppetry traditions from all around the world. And then um, in the United States, more than in other countries, we have famous puppets and famous puppeteers. So if you go towards the Jim Henson collection, you're gonna be seeing lots of famous puppets and learning about famous puppeteers. So um, as you come through, uh, right now we're looking at our Muppet Show gallery. It, start, it goes chronologically through his life and starts out very um, early on with, uh, we, we are fortunate enough to have a couple of things from Sam and Friends as well and talk about um, Jim and Jane and how they started together and, and how important uh, that relationship was to the uh, evolution of all of this. And then um, you work your way through to the Muppet Show and uh, we're very lucky that we have um, in our collection, not just some of the stars, but we really are able to talk about Jim's work in this wide breadth. And we have characters that usually when I'm talking to people, people might not have, know about them, but talking to this audience, I'm sure you all would know who I was talking about, but um, we have 
um, lots of anything Muppets, we have prototypes, we have um, lots of really amazing things. So we're able to tell the story that way. Um, this is our Sesame Street gallery. We just uh, celebrated the 50th anniversary of Sesame Street. And so we uh, put, we did what we call the all stars that so we put them all in there so that you can uh, come and see. And then um, when we lost Carol Spinney recently, we moved Oscar in with Big Bird so that they are kind of there in tribute to him, which um, seemed like the appropriate thing to do in this space. Um, this is a, a snapshot of our Dark Crystal exhibition. Um, I mentioned that we have a special exhibits gallery and we do different topics in there. Um, some of them are just globally related. We had an exhibition before this on the history of Indian puppetry, uh, but um, then we were able to really dig deep into the Dark Crystal and, um, and we'll talk more about this in a little bit about um, how hard it was to conserve all of these puppets, but um, we have such a great breadth of the work of the Dark Crystal and it was such a passion project for Jim that it's really great that we can uh, highlight that whole story in one room together. Um, this is our Muppet workshop. Uh, it, it's meant to look like where the Muppets are made. There's some interactive elements in there. But what I love about this space is this allows us to highlight some of these puppets that um, are a little bit more obscure or, um, so right now we have things from Farscape. We have um, some other Sesame Street characters in there that are lesser known and uh, lots of great examples of um, King Gosh Posh, lots of different things. And um, we are, like I said, we are really happy to have uh, items from the fantasy films and um, people really love Labyrinth. So I wanted to make sure that you knew if you haven't been to visit us and you get a chance to come do that someday, uh, we have a really great um, exhibit on Labyrinth as well. That's a part of the permanent exhibition. So are we up to Barbara now? Yes, um, I think, I so think so. Mommy, um, you have a, quite a big collection and why don't you tell us a little bit about what you've got? Yeah, I'll tell you a little bit about the breadth of the collection. Um, we have, I would say about 500 plus objects, maybe up, upwards of, a, of somewhere in the neighborhood of 150 or so puppets um, that, you know, again, really span some of the big stars to some of the, um, you know, just the cast of characters that, 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 that fill, fills in the story. Um, what, what you're looking at now on the screen is um, what we call our puppet wall. It's kind of like what greets you when you enter our Jim Henson exhibition. And um, we kind of organize it this way to give people a sense of the breadth of the types of puppets and characters that were created. Um, none of these are the ones that you're seeing on the screen right now are, are big stars and it's probably why we were allowed to put them together from different, you know, <laughs> different worlds. So you'll see, you know, there's things from the Muppet Show, there's things from Sesame, there's things from uh, the Dark Crystal all in one spot, which is typically not what we do when we tell the stories. But, um, but, but we're, we bring them together here to give you a, a, a sense of the, of the breadth of the kinds of, of puppets that were created. Um, you know, the puppets that, that people would wear on their heads, um, puppets that require two hands, um, foam latex puppets, et cetera, just to give a sense of the breadth of Jim's career. Um, we obviously, we have um, puppets from Sesame Street. And um, again, I, you know, we'll talk about this a little bit more all together, but it's so interesting how the three of us have, um, have a lot of the same objects, but we, we wield them in ways that, um, that overlap, but th that are distinct. So, you know, some, some of what we emphasize is about performance and about adapting performance for television, similar to what, what, what Ryan was saying earlier. Um, and one of the really wonderful things we have are not just the puppets, which of course are amazing, Big Bird and, and Cookie Monster and Elmo and Fairy Dawn, but um, Fran Brill donated the boots that she wore. You can see them there in the picture, those high black boots that she wore. She's a, a, a female, a, um, a, a, you know, a, a, a female puppeteer who is quite a bit shorter than her mostly male colleagues who were on the tall side. And she had these boots that she wore so that they, the puppets were sort of on par with each other. So, so, so all of those things that, um, that, that, that show the puppets and you're enchanted by them and it's wonderful, but that also kind of bring you behind the scenes so that you have a sense of, of how, how, you know, how things were accomplished. Um, Muppet 
material here. Um, we, we obviously, we, we have a lot of puppets at them. We also have costumes as well. So um, we have Janice's costume and, and Elmo's. And um, again, with that emph emphasis on behind the scenes and production, we have, you, if you can see on the wall there on the left-hand side, um, sketches on loan from uh, the Jim Henson Company archive that give a sense of the design of the puppets, but also the costume designs too. So these were all, you know, all, all of these puppets came into being as a series of creative choices. So we're really in our exhibition and also um, what we're able to um, to augment our own collection with both from borrowing from the the archive and through other means to to really tell the story about the creative co collaboration that Jim and um, and and his company made. So it's it's an exhibition about Jim, but it but you really come out the other side, understanding that it it really sort of takes this um, th this amazing company of of uh, performers and, and designers and builders and writers and musicians to, to, create, to create that world. Barbara, before you take that picture away, yeah. you wanna just tell about the Swedish chef? Um, sure, <laughs> yes. So, <laughs> so one of the, um, like, like I, I think I mentioned before, there, there are puppets that are, there are puppets that are hand puppets. And then there mm -hmm. are some that, you, that require two hands. They're called live hand puppets where you, re requires um, like a main puppeteer to operate the mouth and one of the hands and then a second puppeteer to go in and, and, and do the other hand, right? That's so, how Cookie Monster, for example, can pick up cookies and put them in his mouth. Exactly. So it takes, you can imagine the choreography that it takes. Um, so that's the case for, for a, a lot of, of the puppets, but the Swedish chef was something unique because he, um, more than most puppets, did a lot of sort of coordinated movement with both of his hands. And also the hands were not inside the puppet. They were, they were live. They were actually seen. So when, so we have the Swedish chef in our collection, it's like, well, what are we, what are we going to do about the hands? How are we going to, I can't show it handless. And then um, someone, I think it was Melissa Creighton at the Jim Henson Company had the idea, which we thought was sort of a joke at the time. She's like, well, let's just get Frank Oz to let us cast his hands and then we'll just make them. And we're like- Because he was ha, the ha. original performer. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I mean, ha ha ha. Like, For the that, hands. That would be amazing. Like if only we could do that, but then in the end we did. So those are Frank Oz's hands. <laughs> the nearest uh, thing to having him in your museum. Yeah, exactly. that's, that's a great exactly. story. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. that was that was really a wonderful way to really capture, really capture, yeah. uh, for your visitors um, the sort of truth about this puppet. And then just the, the last thing that I'll say about the the span of the collection, we also get very much into. Um, the um, Jim and his colleagues as technical innovators. So we we um, we definitely get into in our in our room that looks at the dark crystal, the development of anim animatronic technology. So we have these fiberglass heads with these servos um, that, um, that 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 were used to to move the puppets remotely. So we're, we're able to to really tell this sort of deeper story about um, how the work was accomplished. Yeah, and those those are Gelfling heads. Um, yes, it is in your collection. Yeah. And, and, and uh, Tom Newby, who worked um, uh, on numerous animatronic uh, projects with the Henson Company, helped you set those up so that they would be um, displayed um, in the way they are supposed to be. And, and then just the final thing, um, we, um, you know, again, we're telling a, a wider story about the, the history of television. That's where, where we also overlap, Brian. And so uh, part of our collection is um, some of the licensed merchandise that came along with, um, with the puppets. So we have the puppets, but we also have the, or some of the earliest Sesame Street merchandise. And we have a lot of Muppet related merchandise and stuff to kind of tell the, the bigger story um, of the of the company and how how it, it sort of transcended the screen and really entered people's lives. Right. Um, so one of the things a lot of people are asking about is conservation, and of course that's that's a big reason why the Henson family and those of us working with them on their collections um, really wanted to partner with existing institutions that um, had those sort of wherewithal to care for these collections because they are uh, complicated objects. They're made of materials that are um, not stable in many cases. They've been well used. The sweat and 
you know, motion and what have you. Um, and um, our friend from Tough Things, Ryan Rowe, asked about the difference between you know, preserving objects, paper objects versus these puppets. And, you know, it's night and day. Um, there's a reason that we continue to hold our, our Jim Henson Company archives and, can, and continue to keep the artwork and documents and papers in our collection. We use them for research and what have you and obviously make them available for loans for you. Um, but they're relatively easy to preserve um, if you have the proper, you know, humidity and light and what have you conditions. The puppets are, are another story. And I think all of you have had conservation challenges um, with these collections. And we've been so delighted with the um, solutions that you've come up with and how you've been able to preserve these for hopefully generations to come. Um, I think, Jill, you have some pictures of uh, yes. some conservation. And you could talk a little bit about that. Um, so the conservation of our Henson collection started before I came on as a staff member. And um, it, the spaces that I showed you, that was all an expansion that we did as well. And that opened in 2015. And uh, to kind of complement that story that I told you about in 1978, when Kermit cut the ribbon, the Henson family came with Kermit and they cut the ribbon to the expansion, mm -hmm. which was really nice. And um, we worked um, for many years to work to make that open and uh this gentleman russ Vick, is just quite a wonderful prince of a human being and he um and uh, his compatriot Fidel Lianza, who you'll see in a minute um they were puppet builders by trade and they worked with conservators to learn what materials they needed to be able to take these puppets and um conserve them so that they could be uh, preserved for generations so we could share them. Yeah, and I know Bonnie, Bonnie Erickson from The Legacy who helped sort of sort out the collection. I think she really came down and helped, helped them set up the conservation shop and she had worked with the conservator in uh, Ryan's museum and learned a lot of techniques that way. Sorry, Karen, I meant to say please jump in and help me with this story at any point, so thank you. <laughs> so um, what they found is that, uh, so rather than, you know, they are still people who build puppets like this right now. There's lots of talented people who work for the Henson Company and, and other places that are building Muppets and creatures now. So rather than just rebuild them, um, we wanted to preserve the original puppets with these wonderful stories like Brian's talking about. So we try to do as much as we can to preserve the original materials. And um, the things that you're seeing here, these are uh, mostly made of foam latex and that um, gets very brittle it starts to leach and it, that needs to be stabilized. So um, basically they taught themselves the chemistry of how to do that. And um, so now uh, Russ uh, still works with us, but um, also works around the country and uh, helps other collections um, uh, to preserve and uh, conserve a lot of the objects that they have in their collection. Oh. This is him working on stuff for that Dark oh, Crystal exhibition that I showed you. No, that's okay, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> um, and this is Vito, who I mentioned. And uh, the sock puppets are different than the creature puppets, obviously. So there's different conservation needs that each have. And um, a lot of these sorts of puppets were made out of something called Scott foam. And when we went to take the puppets and, and make them be able to be preserved for exhibition, that had all just turned into dust basically. So um, they worked very hard to replace a lot of those materials and to build bodies essentially inside the puppets of uh, at the foam and, and different uh, archival materials. So um, we use lock line so that the puppets can be um, posed but so that everything is archival safe in there so that those puppets will uh, stay with us for many, many years. Mm -hmm. This is Agra, she's a <laughs> latex puppet. And uh, um, we have this really great video. Uh, if you guys uh, are interested, please go over to YouTube and just Google the Center for, or YouTube, the Center for Puppetry Arts. There's a great conservation video where uh, Vito and Russ are talking about this work. And uh, oh Russ talks about how excited he was when he opened the Agra box and, and he got to work on her. So um, that's why I wanted to include her here. And then um, I love Dr. Teeth, so I <laughs> uh, wanted to make sure that we uh, highlighted him. And this is our <laughs> workshop where a lot of this work was done. That's great. So I think, uh, I think our story is, is, is teed up next. Mm -hmm. um, this is Raleigh Cruson, the master puppet builder at the Jim Henson Company. Um, 
so I, I love talking about that I love talking about conservation. I, that's like my, one of my favorite things is getting getting into that because it was, it, it's such a challenge. And you know, like most of the um, most of the material in the collection of Museum of the Moving Image was not made for, to last, like in many collections nowadays. So you know, you're you're um, you're faced with a situation of what we call inherent vice, where uh, the objects are kind of like turning against themselves. Um, these things were, were 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 never made with the idea that they would um, that they would have you know a, a, that they would have to go on that they were being built for archival use. So when we we um, acquired this collection, you know obviously there, there we we had to do things to make. Um, to sort of make sure that they were going to last for the generations. That's, that's what we were charged with, right? And as, as stewards of, of these collections, um, we wanted to make sure that the outsides of the puppets looked great. And in most cases, they, they, they really did. They, 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 they looked very, very similar to, you know, the day that they were born. But the insides were a different story. I think someone was mentioning before, they're made of Scott foam that turns to dust and, and all these kinds of things. Um, so we had to come up with ways of what, what are we going to put inside them so that they still sort of retain their supple puppetness and they don't look completely stiff, but that um, that remains stable. And um, it's not like there were that many, you know, it's not like there are conservators that you can call up and say, Okay. Oh, I hear you're a you know a Muppet conservator. Come, we right. need your help. We kind of had to, you know, invent a, a way of moving forward. And um, we engaged a couple of um, fine art conservators who work with objects to meet um, in a, 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 have a series of meetings with the folks at the Jim Henson's Creature Shop, including Raleigh and Melissa Creighton and Jason Weber and the other folks there to come up with a way to use the appropriate kinds of material um, that would last over time. And that was, it was fantastic to see all of that happen. And then um, what resulted from that was kind of a toolkit that the conservators helped put together, identifying the types of material that would be appropriate and long lasting. And then the work itself was done at the shop. So how, how amazing was that? <laughs> that um, that that Raleigh and her colleagues, like David Valentine, these you know various people, got to work on these puppets. Um, and in Raleigh's case, she she was charged with conserving some of the puppets that she built in the 1970s. So it was really a special thing to to watch. Um, it was really it was really a wonderful wonderful yeah. experience for us. Um, but um, like like Joe was, was mentioning before, the phone latex is a is a whole nother story. So you know, <laughs> it's it's one thing to um, to get these kind of muppety puppets, these soft puppets, and like I said, they look kind of great on the outside, and then on the inside, we have to make sure that they stay solid. Um, foam latex, you know, back in the days in, when the dark crystal and labyrinth were made. Um, the kinds of material that was being used and, 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 and those, the people that make this kind of work now are using um, different types of material like based in silicone, so they're a little bit more long lasting, but at that point we're using materials that were just so fragile. So um, this is a, a Skeksis that we have that was in its, its crate and it, I mean, for, for its age, it looked really, really good, but it needed, needed a lot of work. So we worked with um, a local conservator, Tom Spina, who is a great shop out on Long Island and does a lot of this work for props and other um, film related objects. And um, what, you know, what we, what we needed to do, and I know Jill and Ryan, you'll both be familiar with this, is like we, we had to conserve these objects. We had to make them look good so that they had a semblance of, you know, the relationship to how they looked on the screen, but we didn't want to return them to screen status because they're they're not brand new objects and we're collecting them for their historical value also so that that was really a fine line to to walk i think especially with the foam latex pieces that we didn't want to fix them and make them look pristine so that you you would compare them to how they looked when they were first made and they would look identical we didn't want to do that we wanted to sort of make you know um stabilize them and make them look great but still retain the history. Of, of well, I think you're walking the line between, you know, preservation and conservation, or exactly. conservation and restoration. Right, um, exactly. Where you're trying to, you know, make sure they don't deteriorate anymore. Yeah. Um, but you also want them to, to 
look good enough so that they make the point of the what you're trying to say about Jim Henson as an artist. And and uh, and, and and to be and to be fair, there are uh, you know the the companies that are involved in sort of stewarding the 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 life the, the life that these characters still have. Right, the Jim Henson Company, and you know Walt Disney, and Workshop, puppets, yeah. and Sesame Workshop with the Sesame puppets. They they want to make sure that they that the puppets who are their characters also have you know look appropriate for right. for the public, which is which is understandable. Right. So um, so it was it was a lot of those conversations, and they were very they were very very fruitful, and I think were were instructive all, all the way around. So you can this is just a detail of Agra's hand where we. You know, we did some in painting, but but again, didn't fix things exactly to how they were. Um, oh, this is um, a, a goblin um, headdress, yeah. costume, right, helmet. So we, we also do just keep costume pieces and not just puppets. Um, oh, and this is now you're up. Well, and and <laughs> Ryan, I think the Smithsonian, um, the gifts to the Smithsonian, the Salmon Friends gifts, were really the first ones uh, of this whole collection of of puppets that were given to museums that um, we we did restoration or conservation work on and your conservation department really um, helped us to uh, identify types of materials and what have you that would be appropriate. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, Barbara and Jill, you, you gave a lot of really great information there um, for an overview, but it, you know, as you said, Barbara, you can't just call them up at conservator, but now you can, right? <laughs> yes. I mean, we're, we're working with the people who have actually kind of made this their, uh, their life mission to help care for these because they're so different than other types of materials that museums collect. Um, you know, the, the, um, the fabric and the exterior is one thing, and then all the stuff that's in the insides is, is really, you know, as historically important. And the first impulse, I think, from a, a museum conservator is try to save all of that material. But you really have to make some hard decisions, as we're saying with this inherent vice thing that, um, you know, if there's something inside of a Muppet that's going to damage it over time, it probably will have to be removed. Um, but at the same time, you don't want to rebuild something, right? You have to kind of find a way to save the historic fabric of it to continue to learn about the object over time, you know. Um, one of the best examples I could speak at length about is the ruby slippers that are also in our collection, which just went underwent a really extensive uh, conservation process. And we learned so much about how the movie was made by studying these mm -hmm. materials in depth and the, the construction of the shoes. So there's so much that you can learn about these objects over time if you don't destroy the original historic fabric of the object. So um, it, it's a really interesting riddle, I think, for you know everybody to work out. And so that I think uh, the conservators that we work with, all of us, have taken this as a unique challenge, starting with the Sam and Friends, and really uh, taking the opportunity to work with, which is very rare, to work with the people who were around for the creation of things, who in some cases put the actual stitches into the puppets that they're working with. So these are the hands of Bonnie Erickson here, who, um, you know, fans of the Muppets probably know very well. She, you know, helped to create Miss Piggy and, uh, along with a bunch of other characters and was, you know, really running the, the, the shop for so long. But she was able to work with Sine Park Evans, who's the museum's uh, chief costume curator, because that's kind of the nearest thing to this. We have costume curators and paper uh, conservators, rather, paper conservators and, and people who work with other types of materials. But these uh, have more in common with costumes, you know, historic uniforms or things like that than anything else. So Bonnie's here working with one of our interns on The Swedish Chef. And this is kind of a, a case study in um, you know, how you have to make some of these decisions as you're trying to figure out not only how do you care for these things, you know, forever, which when you, you donate something to a museum, it should be there forever, but also to display it in a way that is true, you know, as, as Barbara and Jill were saying too, true to the original intent of how you would have seen this on the screen and not just you know, these things could easily just look flat. And, you know, <laughs> at some points, I'm sure all of us have, as we're processing things, just been laying the Muppets down flat in drawers. And it's really a morgue-like situation when you go into your storage <laughs> and you pull open a drawer. It's not the way that anybody wants to see the Muppets. You know, they need to have life to them. And uh, one of the things that we found is actually keeping them on conservation-approved archival mounts is the best situation for some of these impermeable and ephemeral materials that if you lay the Swedish chef and his foam face in a tray, it's going to dent over time and hasten the interior uh, deterioration rather than him actually being on a mountain and standing up. So it works well in both ways. So as we continue to go through here, I, I think you'll see some of the, um, the concerns that we had. 
Um, uh, here's Sine, the museum's uh, conservator, working with Bonnie on the original Grover here, uh, who's a, a different color than the Grover that we all know and love, but this is the one that was used in uh, late night show appearances and things like that before he actually made his debut on Sesame Street. Um, and I think these might be out of order from what I, I thought, but there's one that shows the interior of the Swedish chef, um, which mm. maybe is, is, yeah. So this is actually what, you know, Sine and Bonnie found as they pulled away to try to get an idea of what was inside the Swedish chef. And we've all talked about the materials that they that's found. Really, that's really disturbing, Ryan. I know. I, <laughs> well, I was going to tell a story about Miss Piggy and, um, you know, she had a, the one that we collected had a tear and I thought, you know, she doesn't want to be seen that way. I'm not going to show those photos. So I thought that was very respectful, you know, his, his ego, <laughs> but, um, just in, in our conservation report about the types of materials that were found inside of the Muppets, you know, uh, leather shoe soles, uh, wood dowels, uh, pins, duct tape, wire, bubble wrap, uh, chicken wire, things like that. So all of these, you know, over time, you can imagine, right, they could rust, they could hasten the deterioration of other components. So we had to make this decision, okay, we're scrapping this thing that was inside of here, uh, you know, took lots of photos and recorded for posterity if there's historical information to be gleaned from this. But this next slide shows something that was really interesting about how do you display this. This sketch on a Kimpton Hotel's uh, notepad was something that Bonnie made for Sine when she was coming to visit the museum and help us with this and said, uh, you know, here's how it actually operated. As we talked about, you know, Frank and Jim would have been inside the Swedish chef, you know, operating the hands and mouth uh, separately. So when you build a mount for him, you have to replicate two different people's arms inside of here. And that's mm -hmm. the way that he's going to most look like himself. But then also, you know, the puppet was built to be held in that way, right? So that's actually gonna help it over time to retain um, its features and all the characteristics that that you want to have this for. So- And, and um, that bottom right picture has those, what are they called, Jill? The link locks or- uh, Lock line. Lock line, yeah. Lock so line, those right. Those beads and, yeah. the, and they come apart and they yep. can be- uh, yeah. But manipulated so they can go in, in the right direction. And then the material is ethophone. Yep. I think is, Thank you uh, for having a picture of that. Um, one of the challenges of putting this together while we're in quarantine was that I didn't have photos of some of the things I wanted to talk about. So yeah. thanks, Ryan. Yeah, no, that's great. <laughs> well, I, I just, you know, I find this stuff fascinating myself because this is another part of museum work that I think people outside of museums don't, don't see, but it's so vitally important to mm -hmm. exhibitions and the care for our collections to really understand what's going on behind the scenes. I mean, you know, we are wearing gloves every time we handle the Muppets. We are doing everything possible to protect them from environmental conditions. I mean, you know, fading from light, um, you know, any dust that could be in the air, the fluctuations in humidity and temperature could be really damaging to, especially where materials meet, things like that. So that's the majority of, of our collections care job is just, you know, protecting these things with our lives. <laughs> and, and that's why when you come to visit us, sometimes you might be disappointed because a certain Muppet might not be on exhibit for the purpose that it had to go and it we say take rest. a nap yeah. Yeah. <laughs> at, at our institution, but um, it's an important part of the preservation that we do is that we have to rotate the objects and it also helps us to keep things fresh and exciting in the exhibits as well. Well, we, we don't have that much more time, but I just um, was hoping that we could talk, um, if you could each tell me a little bit, um, you know, what is the sort of big impact having the Tents and Puppets has had on your institution and, and what are you planning for the future? Um, I think we'll do you last, Barbara. Um, so why don't we um, start with you, Jill, if that's okay. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Having the Henson Collection has just been such a boon to the Center for Puppetry Arts. We're um, able to tell our story in such a, just a, a much broader way. We're able to attract visitors that we weren't able to before. We're so thankful to the Henson family. We, um, you know, being able to tell that our story in a way that attracts people who maybe, you know, here in the United States, people think, oh, puppetry, that's for kids and then they just dismiss it out of hand. Mm -hmm. And um, one thing I really love is when people come to the institution and they go in the museum and they're like, um, I, I just interested in seeing Jim Henson stuff. And then they'll come out and they're like, oh, how, I couldn't believe all the wonderful things that I saw. And there'll be connections. Um, I'm sure all of you as Henson fans, there's gonna be at least one other thing in the museum, Madam or Gumby or the Mystery Science Theater puppets um, that you'll connect with and people get really excited and then they kind of start to see how much an, an important art form puppetry is. And then, um, you I know, think that was important to Jim Henson too. He was yeah. a huge supporter of the puppetry, the overall puppetry art 
and community. And so having his work in the context of the puppetry center is um, extraordinary. And um, we have a replica of a, a Hanson office and his Unima mm -hmm. card, which is the international uh, puppetry organization as well as Puppeteers of America card there, you know, to really illustrate that to people. And um, something really cool happened uh, when we did get this collection is that we started to get um, audience members. We've always had programming from children to adults um, and we have great puppet shows for adults, uh, but people started to come that didn't have kids mm -hmm. or people came and they didn't bring their kids on purpose. <laughs> and so we were able to um, have all these really great events and really expand our audience in a way that we weren't able to do before uh, 2015, which has um, been just so thrilling for me. And as a Henson fan myself, you know, this is a dream job for me. So I, I really appreciate getting to be part of this and um, it just, it, it really, really has great. meant a lot. And, and Ryan, how about uh, the, you have such a big institution. This is a small collection. Yeah, yeah, but you know, how incredible is it that the, the Muppets are one of the most requested thing by visitors when they come in and they go to the visitor desk and say, you know, where are the Muppets? And it's up there with the ruby slippers and Abraham Lincoln's top hat, you know? For, for a museum with as broad a mission as ours to look at all of American history, um, you know, the Muppets are so much a part of people's lives and how they understand the world around them, you know, things that they grew up with. And, you know, we're kind of in our exhibitions constantly testing, you know, what can't the Muppets do? What can't we talk about through them? That's why this uh, Muppets Take American History concept that'll be rolling out, you know, sometime whenever we can get back into the museum. You know, uh, if you put Miss Piggy in the First Lady's exhibit and somebody comes into the museum and they ask, where are the Muppets? And they go up and see her there. They're going to learn about the First Ladies and learn about the presidency <laughs> in a way that maybe they that. didn't intend to see, yeah. right? And so, um, you know, they speak to a, a, a wide variety of ways that we understand understand what it means to be an American. And uh, so that's that's what's like kind of the continuing legacy that I love about it. Um, and then, you know, one of the, you were asking about future plans, we're mm -hmm. working on a major exhibition that's going to scheduled to open in 2021 mm -hmm. called Entertaining America that looks at all American history through music, sports, and entertainment. And of course, the Muppets are going to be a major part of that too. And that's a 20 year show. So uh, it'll be open for a very long time and really be a great place to come and see the Muppets when you're in Washington, DC. So oh, that's great. Now, Barbara, You've, you've talked a little bit about the fact that you've had to move offices because of this collection, but yes. uh, what else? Um, well, we have our Jim Henson exhibition. It's ongoing. Um, you know, we, we, um, it's, it will be, be there for a long time. We have other puppets that will rotate in. We also, um, I mentioned a little bit before, but I'll, I'll echo that, um, that there are objects in our exhibition that are on loan from uh, the collection that uh, Karen and Susie uh, work on, um, and that, that that's that's really fantastic. And also our traveling show that goes around the country. Um, I think it would. Um, so right now it's um, it's in Albuquerque. Hopefully you'll get to see it in Albuquerque when they uh, get to reopen, whenever that is. And then it'll uh, travel around to a bunch of other cities, and then uh, maybe an international tour after that. Um, but you know, we we it, what what it's meant for us. Is, is so much. And, you know, I think we probably don't have time to talk about all those things, but um, it, it's, it's funny, um, Jill, you mentioned getting more adults without their kids. Um, you know, what it, one thing that, that the collection did for us is it enabled us to move our curriculum offering to younger audiences. So we never had K through three education programs, but we use um, our Henson collection and that exhibition as, um, as a way to engage with young kids, which is fantastic. We also do programs um, related to um, using puppetry with children on the autism spectrum. Um, that is a, a project that Cheryl Henson, who's on our board, is a big part of, and, and we really appreciate. Um, that's been something that, that we've been working in partnership with. Um, and just being a locus for the Henson community um, both the people that have worked behind the scenes and the, the incredible fan base and some of you are out there and we love seeing you and you come to come into our building and I'm glad that some of you are here with us tonight virtually um, and we have regular screenings and you know Jim's work in film and, and television allows us to 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 do a lot of work in our theaters that explores his legacy as well so it's material with Craig Shevin exactly the the inimitable Craig Shaman, who is a guest curator for, for those events. 
Um, so it's really become um, um, an unexpectedly major focus for us, which has and been- You have another special exhibit right now as well. Yes, I'm glad you mentioned that. Actually, you, why don't, you wanna say something about that? Well, um, the Museum of the Moving Image has a special exhibit right now of some of the puppets and the production materials from Jim Henson's uh, Dark Crystal, The Age of Resistance. So that's the show that the Jim Henson Company has on Netflix right now. Yeah. And um, it's so exciting to see the new materials um, in the context of your museum, especially because you have the Skeksis from the original Dark Crystal on display. And, um, you know, the quality of the, of the craftsmanship, you know, did not decrease at all. I mean, obviously, they're just so spectacular. And um, it's great to have a place to be able to highlight those sorts of things. Yeah. And um, we hope to be able to get some more on display um, in other places as well. Um, so we, we the sort of don't really have too much time for questions. Um, you've answered a lot of them. There were a lot of conservation questions. I think people found that really, really interesting. Um, but um, people were saying, are there, are, do you have favorites or are there things in your collection that you haven't displayed that you'd really love to display? Um, Ryan, do you have a favorite in your collection or? Yeah, it's it's the obvious choice, I think, and the, the easy answer for me is the original Kermit. I mean, uh, working in this at the American History Museum, you see things every day that are incredible, extraordinary objects. But you know, every time I see Jim Henson's original Kermit, it still like you know takes my breath away a little bit. You know that this was such a uh, a fascinating window into a mind of a creative genius, and you know it's created so much. So much has come of it over time, um, and I love telling people about you know the story of him making this out of his mother his coat and mm -hmm. the ping pong ball for the eyes and things like that. So um, people really connect with it. And, uh, you know, it's one of those moments when I take people on a storage tour, you know, and I open up the cabinet, like their eyes get so big. That, that happened to me. I will <laughs> yeah. tell you that, that yeah. I was just, it was amazing. I will be coming to visit you someday. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you have another Kermit that Jim performed that he donated to the museum in 1980 as well. Yeah, that's um, right. At the same time that you got Charlie McCarthy, I think, from Edgar Bergen. So, That's right. Um, yeah. So you can see the difference in how it's changed over time and, you know, compare it to your little book of all the felt samples. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't have any uh, samples from his mother's coat, though. Unfortunately. <laughs> You've got those. And and Jill, do you have a favorite? Um, it, it, when we were doing this, uh, we all decided to pick one. And it was very hard for me to choose because there's so many great Muppets. But um, I, I Barbara was asking me what's the story behind this and it's not very not as quite as good as she was probably hoping but um <laughs> so uh before I became the museum director at the Center for Puppetry Arts I worked in the fundraising department I have uh, been very lucky I've had a very interesting museum nonprofit career um for about 20 years and so when I first moved to Atlanta that's where I was working and as this was all happening I was uh helping with the finishing touches of getting the fundraising happening and um so when we had a staff preview of the World of Puppetry Museum. There were other people working on it and we were able to go through and I came around the corner and I saw this face and this is what made me cry. <laughs> um, I was just so excited to see Sprocket, my childhood friend um, there in the museum as a, a place where I got to work and be part of every day. So uh, that's the story. And like, it's not such so much about the puppet, but just about me. <laughs> And Barbara. So, yeah, so this this is this is at the risk of being repetitive. Um, so this is this is this is Kermit, but um, but the and I don't know. It's so hard. You can't really pick a favorite, right? I, I would say that one of the one of the objects that I feel kind of the most energy from is the headband yeah. that's next to Kermit, and it was really important for us from our perspective right, from sort of our lens of, of what our museum does is to show Kermit, obviously, but next to Kermit is an instrument that Jim used to perform him. So it's Jim, it's Jim's headband is that um, a, a microphone was, you know, came, came, came down from and that, that's what, what Jim would wear to, um, while he was performing Kermit. So it's, it's almost like they're there together. Um, and that's what greets people when they walk into the exhibition. So I, I've always found that um, kind of particularly meaningful. 
Oh, well, it's, yeah. it's great. It's great to see it in that context, of course. I was able um, to come to your institution last August, and that was definitely something that hit me. I thought it was really lovely the way you had that exhibited. Cool. <laughs> well, it's so nice that the, the four, the three of you can, um, you know, know each other and you know each other's collections and uh, share resources and um, work together, you know, for years to come. Yes. Um, thank you thank for you supporting Barbara, that so and making much. that happen. Yes. <laughs> Well, I, I really appreciate um, Momi for uh, hosting this tonight and having a chance to have this conversation. Um, it's very gratifying to me to know that all these people are continuing on um, work I've been doing for a long time and, and you know, it's in such good hands and that's great. Um, I wanted to thank um, the directors of your institutions, um, Carl Goodman at Momi, um, and Thea Hartig at the National Museum of American History, and then the founder of uh, Vince Anthony um, at the Center for Puppetry Arts um, for supporting what you do and for um, recognizing that the Henson material is an important part of your collection. Um, and that's really so much appreciated. And, um, and then all the support um, that we get from, as Barbara mentioned, you know, the Jim Henson Company, the uh, Muppet Studios at, at Disney and uh, the Sesame Workshop and um, the people on the Jim Henson Legacy Board, the Henson family. So um, it takes- And the fans. And, yeah. and the fans, of course. And you yes. guys, thank you so yes. much. Yes, the fans um, and, and that Muppet Wiki that we all use every day. <laughs> so, um, so thank you. When thank we can you, all yeah. leave the house again, please come and see all of us. Yes. yes. <laughs> yes. 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 Yes, we'll leave, you. we'll leave you with this slide. Okay. Thank you guys so much for coming. It's nice to talk to everybody. Thank okay. you. Take care, everybody. Good night. Take care. Bye. Bye.